in uh, L.A. Well, I saw shows too. And then there was Shindig and. And do you ever remember Hullabaloo? Hullabaloo. Okay, you do remember Hullabaloo, those, right? Sure. But weren't but those, those British? Were, well, those were nighttime shows. Okay, but were they British yeah. or no? I thought one of them was British. Maybe. I do remember the Action 66 or Action 67. I, I think it was an ABC show, and it came on in the afternoons after school. Mm -hmm. And then there was Soul Train. Well, that Don, that was awesome, Don Cornelius. That was a great show. Yeah. Yeah. Another host who he uh, just passed, passed away, and he had a yeah. horrible last few years. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. Depression and yeah, it's too bad. Ben, do I have this right? I got about two minutes here. Yes. Okay, let, 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 me go through, let me go through all our announcements here, which will only take a sec, but we want to thank everybody who's watching us live tonight. want to especially thank our media partners and our friends who are embedding this show with a special shout out to DrivenMavens.com, who's picking up the show regularly every week now, which is terrific. want to thank our moderators in the chat room for doing all the moderation there. Remember, everybody, we'd love to get your questions. We got Art Spinella from CNW Marketing with us tonight. We'll be talking about all kinds of things. Email us, send it to viewer mail at outolinedetroit.tv or give us a call at 1 620 288 6546. Remember, you can get the podcast to the show at iTunes tomorrow. It's free. Just look for Outoline After Hours and you will be able to get it. And we're going to get going here in about another minute or so. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion, and by Chevrolet, Chevy runs deep. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's great to have you with us again, and especially not just me speaking here, but Mr. D. Lorenzo. Hey, John, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And this is sort of semi-Italian week because we have Arturo <laughs> Spinella joining us, hey, too. <laughs> como esta? Como esta? <laughs> Art Spinella from CNW Marketing. Great having you back on the show. Holding up, my, holding up the bandon part here. And yeah. the tiger. Yeah, he's wearing a, a hoodie. Don't wear that yeah, to the drugstore, man. Hoodie. Or, <laughs> they're going to shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> Art space near the those fabulous golf courses, and you don't golf, right, Art? Oh yeah, I do now. Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah, I, it was hard to. It was finally hard, too hard to ignore. Yeah, yeah, great, great courses. I'm sure you had all kinds of pressure of people there to say, "Come on, come on, let's go golfing." All the time, <laughs> and, and it's it's annoying because I'm not. I can't do it often enough to be good at it. So I kind of go out there and 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 divot everything that was in sight. Yeah. It looks like mole holes by the time I'm finished. Huh. Well, as yeah. long as you have fun, that's the only thing. That's that's the point. It looks like Max Headroom there. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing you said it, not us. <laughs> Jeez. Well, I had an interesting week. I was uh, down in Austin, Texas, because Dodge had the. Uh, the media rollout for the new Dodge Dart. In fact, they're gonna run something like 200 journalists through this program, including people coming in from overseas. Yeah, funny, I didn't get my invitation. <laughs> yeah, must have been yeah. lost. Yeah, me either. <laughs> uh, I can't say anything about the car, because it's maybe nah, not even next week, maybe the week after, because everything's embargoed till then. But the one thing I gotta say is, they had competitive product there, which is gutsy. I love it when car companies do that. Yeah. And they had this 11-mile uh, loop that you could go drive. You know, uh, 
highway speeds, two lane roads, you know, a mixture of things. And I got to tell you, uh, I drove, you know, competitive products back to back to back for over an hour. And here's the astonishing thing. I'll rate them as to best to worst in my book. And this shocked me the way I rated them. Now, again, this is just getting in these cars and driving. There was no real high speed stuff, no high speed cornering or really rough roads or anything like that. So it's just cruising at comfortable speeds. What's the most comfortable car? What has the nicest interior? And are you ready? I thought the Chevy Cruze was the best car in the segment. I thought hot on its heels was the, the Ford Focus. Yep. Then I would put the Dodge Dart. Then I would put the, the Hyundai Elantra. Then the Honda Civic. And then the Toyota Corolla. And man, just a few years ago, I think that that order would have been flipped completely. Well, you know, last time I drove a Cruze, I thought it was sensational. It is. And I've always loved the Focus. So I think the world of those two cars. So. Well, you're not alone, Peter. Uh, you know, we see the, 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 um, the response to both of those cars uh, from the owners. Uh, recommendations are really high. Um, not so much for the Cruze yet, but, but certainly for the Focus. And, uh, you know, not so much anymore for the Corolla or the, uh, or the Civic. Yeah, and, and what really surprised me is, you know, it was just a few years ago, the Americans were doing cheap interiors with hard plastic. Guess what? Mm -hmm. That's the Civic and the Corolla right now. All hard plastic. A reasonable amount of road noise, more than the other cars that I mentioned. And it's, it's just weird to me to see, under the test conditions that I was driving on, that I thought that Chevy and Ford and, and now Dodge had the best cars in the segment. Where was, and, where was the loop? Does it originate downtown? Or no, 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 no. Downtown? This was out in a little place called Albert, Texas. Population four is what the sign said. But they told us it's really population three because them two got divorced. <laughs> 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 so we're out in the middle of nowhere in the hill country, you know, which is a great place to drive. Yeah, it's beautiful. But, and, and I'm telling you, this is not, you know, McElroy Pro Detroit, blah, blah, blah stuff. I'm telling you, this, this was my rating of those cars under those driving conditions. That, that, was something I did not expect. Well, you know, it's it's good. And if you drive the cars, you realize how good they are. I mean, yeah. we're talking state-of-the-art, smaller or compact cars. Now, I, I wasn't comparing prices and how they were optioned out because they didn't have uh, the Monroney's, you know, the sticker that explained all the equipment and the price. So that, that could skew my voting. I'm just saying, jumping in the car and taking it on this loop and then getting right into the next one and driving it on the loop is how I ranked them, but just kind of interesting what went on this week. And then there's this week end with the Bahrain Formula One Grand Prix. And Peter, what the hell is gonna go on there this weekend? I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think they should have gone there. I don't either. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I hope there isn't, you know, violence or some sort of you know, dangerous stuff to disrupt the actual on-track stuff, but you know, it's kind of a, a, a bad deal and they shouldn't be racing there. I don't know if you saw, it came out uh, that, I think it was one of the Forest India cars, the mechanics and everything were moving and they were involved by near some firebomb that went off. And uh, so like two of the mechanics said to the team, hey, get us out of here. We want to go home immediately and they're leaving. And uh, boy, I I'd, I'd like you hope nothing happens, but what the hell are they doing there in the first place? Well, yeah, they should, it shouldn't have gotten to this point. I, I, don't, I don't believe it shouldn't have gotten to this point. They should have said, you know, we can't, uh, we can't involve ourselves in this and we can't, you know, expose, you know, our racing organization, the people, anything. We can't do it. I mean, well, they, they canceled last year's race because that's when the Arab Spring was really getting going. Right. Now, clearly, it hasn't calmed down at all. It's still roiling the whole Middle East. But I guess money talks and they just had too much money on the line and it'll the organizers... A, it'll be an armed camp, you know. It could be bad. <laughs> well, I mean, it'll be an armed camp to get to get to go through to get to it. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. I don't know. I just hope nothing happens at the race. And, you know, Bernie just helicopters in, so he doesn't have to deal with anything. So. Yeah. 
And then another big thing that came out in the news at the beginning of the week is uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration finally came out and said, yeah, you know all that sudden unintended acceleration problem that Toyota had? Well, guess what? It's, it was pedal misapplication. It was people making mistakes and putting their foot on the gas and not the brake. Yeah, that's, that's the duh of the decade. But, you know, so much money was expended, so much media noise, so much hand-wringing. And you and I talked about it. And, and you said the best thing was, gee, has anyone reported this with a manual transmission? No. No. Nope. You, you know, it's just... Uh, and, you know, the, unfortunately, too many of our Washingtonians down there just, you know, they go on these witch hunts and uh, create this havoc, you know, in the country, in the media. And then, you know, everyone ignores the reality, which is, hey, driver error, folks. Well, I'm gloating because this is exactly what I said. We said, really. Two years ago, when all this broke with Toyota, over, over two years now, because to me, it was the Audi unintended acceleration thing all over again. And, you know, you've got these professional plaintiff attorneys who make their entire living all year long, decades long, just suing the car companies. And that's what the media runs to and covers. And some of this nonsense that came out that, you know, there was this one guy who figured out how to short circuit Toyotas so that it would cause unintended acceleration, something that could never happen in the real world. And then when that was poo-pooed, then they came out and said, oh no, but there's these tin whiskers that grow within electronics and maybe that was the cause of the thing. And all along we were saying, no, this is, this is people putting their foot on the gas instead of the brake. And so I like to gloat about this because this is what we said. If you go back and look at the shows, just wait a couple of years. Wait until there's thorough studies about this, and it's going to come out that it was driver error, not some mysterious gremlins in the electronics. Of course, it's like a correction of the newspaper. Oh, it, 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 it didn't even make the national. Didn't even make the first ten pages of the paper. Right. Didn't make the national news. Nothing. Well, the worst part about all of that, Peter, and you know, is is that. Uh, you know, we saw this significant decline in in consideration of Toyota products simply because of that. So it it cost Toyota not only sales, but it cost them uh, a big chunk of their um, uh, of the respect that Toyota normally had had up to that point. And there's no way to defend against that. There, once it's out, anything that one of the car companies says is going to be perceived as just being. Uh, um, you know, CYA, and uh, nothing more than that. Yeah, it was definitely the, uh, for the first time, it was the chink in the Toyota armor. And they, you know, up until that time, Toyota's image was, you know, impeccable. And, you know, everyone just, you know, I, I would imagine half the Toyota buyers are repeat buyers because that's all they ever drove and they'll just go get another one. But, you know, that incident combined with the, the quality issues, you know, I would say that 20% of those true believe, former true believers of Toyota went to other makes. But Art, you have those kind of numbers. But Yeah, well, actually, Peter, you're just about right. It was about 23% that went somewhere else. Uh, the repeat rate for uh, some of the Toyota products, especially the Camry, uh, fell from 70% to the mid-50s, which, uh, which is a, a gigantic percentage. Gigantic. See, what ticks me off about this, too, is that if you blame the electronics, mysterious gremlins in the electronics, which don't exist at all, then you really don't get to the root cause of the problem. And I think there's several things here. What, what NHTSA came out and admitted is that this mostly happens to older drivers, and most of them are women. Now, that's so wrong, so non-PC to be able to say, but that's what the facts are. So then you got to start looking at why is this? Should these older drivers be getting remedial driving classes? Uh, I would love to know how many of them have diabetes. Because as you guys may know, people with diabetes can lose the feeling in their feet. They may not even get a good feel for whether their foot is on the brake or not. And maybe some of it has to do with 
maybe the brake's too close to the gas pedal. Maybe, you know, they shouldn't be in the same plane, or maybe there should be some adjustments. But what I'm getting at is, if you blame these mysterious electronics, which, by the way, is great to go into a courtroom and argue in front of a jury about, you don't get to the root cause of the problem, or you don't get to the right kind of a fix. You know, with Audi, the unintended acceleration thing largely went away when they started the the shift lock mechanism where you could not put the thing in drive until you had your foot on the brake and then you yeah. could pull it out of park. And that got rid of most of the problem. That almost destroyed Audi in the U.S. market. I, I still resent 60 minutes for that. Completely. Completely. That was the, the a blatant hatchet job. It was, oh, I was just going to use the exact same word. Yeah. Definitely a hatchet job. And they weren't the only ones. I mean, you know, Dateline did their whole thing. With the, and with the GM pickup. With the GM. Blowed up real good. <laughs> <laughs> right. I remember, they, I remember they blew it up. Right, right. <laughs> they put explosives on it. It's just like, what are you guys I know, doing? I know, it's crazy. And, and there's been other national news programs that just go in and trash cars and trash the auto industry, and they believe these plaintiff attorneys as if it's the gospel, you know? They believe these bogus theories that these guys come up with, and they, they come up with these, you know, contrived explosives tied to the gas line, you know, and show all the video of that. So it's really annoying. Yeah, it man. really is annoying. And, you know, Toyota, it's just amazing. I mean, here's a car company that led the, the Asian onslaught into this market, which the domestics largely ignored until it was too late. And... Uh, I mean, talk about gold-plated reputation. All those years, all those accrued quality numbers and consumer reports numbers and all of that stuff. I mean, it was severely impacted in 24 months. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. Unbelievable. Right. You know what's interesting, too, though, is one good thing we're getting out of it is now Toyota's got to style good-looking vehicles. Well, yeah, Akio, <laughs> Akio Toyota's, you know, it's good that they're hungry again. I know. I think it's good. Look, I, I've got a lot of respect for Toyota, and uh, they'll be back. But that's the one good thing is they know now that, like you're saying, their bulletproof rep reputation for quality has been shattered. And the gap that they had, the advantage that they had in fuel efficiency is largely evaporated. Oh, yeah, so now what do you got to do? Well, you better design cars that people really want to go out and buy just because they look terrific. Yeah, and design, now we're starting to get good design out of Toyota. Design, you know, design is a thing. will continue to be more important by the minute in this business. Yeah. Well, both of you guys have seen the, um, seen the Accord, uh, or at least what will be the new Accord. What do you guys think? I, I'm glad they told me it's the new one, because <laughs> I couldn't tell. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm more worried about Honda than Toyota. Oh, completely. No, look, Toyota, I think, is already on the comeback trail. But Honda, I, I just don't see it happening there. And they, you know, I like the looks of the CRZ, and they, at one point, were going to do a non-hybrid version mm -hmm. with a, you know, a performance version. And they didn't. And, you know, the Accord is just another a different shade of vanilla. You know, I don't know. What, what, what do you well, think of the Accord, uh, Art? Well, uh, the Accord has really started to suffer uh, rather dramatically. Um, number one, the repeat rates are down from 70 to, or consideration rates among men and women are down from the mid to high 70s percent of all people looking for that particular type of a vehicle uh, down into the 30 and 40 percent range which is uh, which is just a horrible thing uh, to be taken off of shopping lists or never put on uh, second their other problem is uh, they have just very old facilities uh, unlike what General Motors is doing to its dealers uh, love it or hate it no, the fact of the matter is that shoot right here and uh, right here the the uh, the Honda dealer here sells Hondas in the back and in the front are the motorcycles and the lawnmowers and the uh, generators. Wow. Uh, was that the, how it so, was I mean, before? It, well, that's, you know, it's the old Honda way uh, of, of uh, the retail establishment. On a 10-point scale, Honda's down into the mid-fives in terms of um, uh, what people think about going into a Honda dealership. Um, it's... it's it, it, you, you don't go to Costco to buy an Armani suit. 
<laughs> and uh, the reality is that you're looking at cars that cost thirty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars, and you're asking them to go into relatively older facilities to do it. Um, they also got very locked into um, trying to do something from a, a marketing standpoint, and their marketing, quite honestly, has been pretty mediocre. Uh, it used to be very identifiable. It was very simple, classic, clean. This is for the Accord. And uh, and now it's like they've gotten onto the same old bandwagon that everybody else is on. A lot of production value, but no message. So um, who, what, what name plates benefited the most from Honda's swoon? Um, Hyundai was number one. Uh, we saw a significant number of people who had a Honda on the shopping list that wound up buying some Hyundai product. Uh, among the Detroit brands, Ford just uh, cleaned up. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, it was at, at the time, uh, I'm sure that with some of the new products that uh, General Motors is coming out with, um, they'll pick up some. There's, there's a resistance among Honda owners to buy Chrysler products. Um, it, it, that's long and complicated, but anyway, there's always a resistance there. Uh, they're willing to buy Hyundai, they're willing to buy Toyota, they're willing to buy Ford. Uh, they resist somewhat General Motors. You know what's uh, interesting? With, you know what's I'm interesting sorry. here, Art? Because we've been talking about this for some time about Honda losing its mojo, and I know we're sounding like a broken record here, but it keeps getting worse. Yeah. Is we've largely focused on the product, which technologically they're kind of behind the times right now. So it's very interesting to hear you say that they got a dealership problem and a marketing problem as well. Oh sure, I mean it's it's. It's just it's just eating them alive. Well, yeah, the marketing problem was fairly obvious, but you know the fall off. You know, it was always the Honda Motor Company, and they have such a, a glorious uh, history and reputation, and it's just like they all went to sleep for a while. You know, I don't get it. Well, I, I still say they're suffering from the same kind of MBA disease that crippled Detroit. You know, it's like we got to cut costs. You know, they, yeah. the, the currency's strong, i.e. the yen. We have to cut costs. You know, we get good fuel efficiency, so we don't have to invest in the latest stuff. Our customers love our cars. And, yeah, you can skate by for, you know, a while. But, boy, it's so competitive right now. You know, go back to what I said before of, of my perception, me and the crews, the Focus and the Dart may be the best cars in their class right now. Yeah. Well, you know... They have a legacy of engineering and and almost engineering for great engineering's sake, almost like the old Mercedes Benz where they would the engineers just said, uh, we like the car now, figure out how to sell it. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. And uh, cost be damn, but this is a fine car and the markers would go, Okay. Well Honda, <laughs> you know, they did that on a you know, a different scale, it was based more on efficiency and and, you know, they almost approach problems in an artistic manner, engineering-wise, just beautiful stuff. And you're right, they, you know, they, they started to cruise, they started to coast. They said, and when you have uh, juggernauts like the Hyundai Group and a reinvigorated Ford and reinvigorated GM, I mean, you're in trouble. Right. And quickly. And quickly, yeah, that, that's what's been so amazing. That's the key, yeah. No, Peter is absolutely right. Remember the old, uh, the compound vortex controlled combustion, yeah. which was the CVCC engine. And that was what, uh, 70s? Oh, geez, that was in the 70s. 75 or Late 78. 70s. Yeah, and it was, it, it got such great reviews that they named the Civic after it, for Pete's sake. I mean, yeah. that was basically the capital C, capital V, capital C yeah. came from the CVCC engine. You know? And, uh. Even I my never good knew friend, that, Dave, or if I did, I forgot it. <laughs> yeah, well, at the time, if you, and here's another piece of, of odd, this is geezer history, but um, Dave, Dave Power, even at the time, when he did a survey of uh, Honda Civic owners, uh, half of them thought they had the CVCC engine in it, and they didn't. They had the regular old, <laughs> regular old engine in the darn thing. But that big C and that little big V and that big C just... And with all of the publicity, they just rode that, they rode that into the sunset. And, you know, and one of my favorite all-time cars, just 
for pure driving pleasure was the S2000. Cool car. Excellent yeah. car. Everything yeah. was worked so well together. It was such a pleasure to drive to me. And uh, uh, the early NSX, you know, a, bu awesome. a buddy of mine ha had one and it was just, wow, this is a really switched down company. And boy, they've, they've fallen so far behind so quickly. Here, here's a question maybe you guys would know. You know how all these new cars these days have push button start instead of sticking a key in the ignition, you push. Wasn't it the, the Honda 2000, S 2000 that yeah. started S 2000 that? Started yeah. that. Or, or revived yeah. it, I should say. Not started it, but you know, brought that yeah. back. That, that was my memory. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hey, look, uh, let's take a, a quick commercial break because we got a lot more to talk about here, but this has been going great. But Ben, let's give a good shout out to our friends at Bridgestone for sponsoring this show. Peter, we got to talk about your column that you wrote this week because we talk a lot about design on this show and we will always talk a lot about design on this show, but you really keyed in on the critical importance of Chevy redoing the new Corvette and Ford redoing the Ford Mustang and getting it right. Well, yeah, I mean, it was a follow-up to last week's column, um, which started about, you know, the sameness of design. And then this week I talked about, you know, given everything going on that, you know, there were excellent cars at the New York show. I mean, really excellent. I mean, we're hypercritical. You know, to most people, you know, well, damn, that's a pretty nice car there. <laughs> it's shiny. <laughs> yeah, it's shiny. But, you know, so we're all, always picking over things. And um, But the sameness of design, I think, is definitely that started to creep into things. And it just got to me th thinking, you know, uh, average consumers out, th out there don't care about this. But in the design community, there's design reach. And there's almost like a design predictability. And, you know, they might label predictability different but design reach they all know what that is i mean chris bangle which i neglected to mention chris in my comment i should have I, that kind of when i was writing it i was going to go there and i you know he took a position with bmw that was obviously controversial some of what his stuff worked some of it didn't uh but that's what reach is mm -hmm. you know you have to you know sometimes you have to you have to go off the reservation a little to right. find what you needed to do. And, you know, let's face it, um, Corvette and Mustang are two of America's greatest night name plates. They are icons of, you know, American automobile might when it used to be mighty. And, you know, even people who don't like cars, when they hear the name Mustang and Corvette, there's still imagery there. Right. And so- <laughs> Globally too, not just in this country. Yes, globally. And here we have hypercritical assignments right now. Now, I know for a fact, I talked with Ed Welburn at the New York show, and he, they just got through having the design sign-off review with Ackerson and the board, whatever, however they do that. And he told me, and I put it on the table, and I'm surprised no one picked it up, but he said, it's the first time in General Motors history that the head of design and the head of Corvette Engineering are in total agreement on this car. Oh, really? Now, so they've always argued in the past. Well, let's not forget, in 63, Mitchell insisted, you know, Larry Shinoda and Mitchell worked on the Stingray. Mitchell insisted on that, the split in the back window, and Zora Duntoff, Corvette Engineering, just went berserk. <laughs> And he went to the mat and I, you know, he, they went down to the 14th floor at GM because they were at the tech center right. and they were pounding the table. And, and what they did is they let, they, they compromise. They sort of let Bill Mitchell win mm -hmm. and Zora, for one year, Zora was all pissed <laughs> off, but then the next year the split was gone. Yeah. So Zora won round two, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's design predictability. I mean, here is Ford and the Mustang. Now they've, they've artfully done the, not the nostalgia, it's not really retro what they've done. They sort of conjured up old Mustang images and shapes and, and artfully put them in the current car, which I think is a really cool car. Mm -hmm. love, love the current car. But you know, the question now is, okay, are they gonna go to the nostalgia well one more time? No, they can't. And that was my point in my column. They absolutely cannot and everyone's, you know, the Evos, if you look at the Evos, 
you know, close one eye and look at it, it's the perfect shape for the next generation Mustang. Is it though? Because it's a full fastback. And I'm wondering, yeah. and you know, Mustangs had fastbacks. Well, that's in the fact, only thing they've shown. Well, the, okay. Now, it, I'm hoping point, they do, a, I, I, I hope they do like a, something we're not expecting. A short deck. Yeah, not I mean, to back. me, you know, it, it's gotta have a long hood and a short deck. Now you can interpret it however you want. But yeah. there's certain proportions that I think yeah, there's certain are proportions. silhouettes that shouldn't be messed with. And, you know, people wrote in and said, well, it can't be the Mustang because, well, the classic line is, well, it's a pretty car, but it ain't no Mustang. Well, you know, you know, that's what the point of the column was. And other people say, well, you can't have a fusion grill. Of course it's not going to have a fusion grill on yeah, it. Right. So I think it's pretty clear from what I understand going on within Ford that the, the next car will be the next car. It won't be... You know, and, and the, the bottom line is, is they have to impress a, a whole new generation. You know, we're already impressed. We love the Mustang. You know, we grew up with the Mustang. I learned how to drive a, sh a stick on a 66 Shelby GT350 Mustang. <laughs> oh, Jesus. So, uh, you know. Don't you hate them, Art? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I learned on a and, 62 Falcon. Well, admittedly, it was. <laughs> I learned driving post office trucks. <laughs> admittedly, it was easy to learn how to drive a stick in that car with all that torque. You, know, right. you just kind of <laughs> move the shift around. But anyway, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, they have to recreate the the excitement of for new people i mean the older people will you know it's a mustang we'll like it but they've got to they've got to go to the next shape the new the new mustang and it's so important to ford more so than than corvette is to gm only because gm has never treated the corvette like ford has treated the mustang ford has treated the mustang as you know this is our iconic car and there's a certain reverence about it and the other point I made about in my column is if you're a designer at Ford or GM and you get to work on the next generation Mustang Corvette, you are at the very pinnacle of your profession. That means people think enough of you and your talent that they're entrusting you. And it's, you know, it's a huge pressure. Well, it's exhilarating, thrilling and frightening. Terrifying. And terrifying. Because you don't want to be the guy who blew it on the yeah. Mustang or the Corvette. Yeah. And now the Corvette is different because I said GM has never treated it with the respect it should have gotten. But make no mistake, it's an iconic American vehicle. It is America's sports car. Yeah, the Viper exists. But come on, the Corvette has been yeah. there, done that for, you know. Yeah, the years. Corvette might get there, but it's got to wait uh, the Viper, decades, yeah, the a couple Viper. of generations, right? Yeah, I meant so, the Viper. So, you know, and I showed the, uh, the Stingray, the Vision concept, and that's not the C7, but there are little touches in there that mm -hmm. kind of telegraph. And, and the th difference is the Mustang's going to be an all-new interpretation of Mustang. The Corvette is the same basic patch package size, and it's going to be a zoomy, you know, looking thing but it's not going to be the game changer that the next one's going to be unfortunately the c8 the eighth generation probably won't be around until 2018. right but that's because i got a question for you peter yeah do you think they'll do uh, a convertible version of the mustang uh yes yeah they yeah, okay. i i don't think uh i don't think they I don't think there can be a Mustang with a, uh, without a convertible version. I just don't think they can do that. For the line to be successful, you have to have more than one model, and obviously a convertible would be more than that. And what I take to heart is this talk that they're designing it to meet European pedestrian standards, which means that this car can now go worldwide, and I hope that includes doing a right-hand steer version of it as well. Because I think when you get into all kinds of different markets around the world, Ford can really use this as a real halo car, not just in the United States, yeah. but around the world. And I would expect them to put a, a four-cylinder EcoBoost in that. Oh, you can, you can bet that the standard motor is yeah. gonna be a four-cylinder EcoBoost. I would, I would, I would bet my, uh, my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can win that bet. No, I, yeah. no, I think in, in this day and age, of course, the standard car is going to have an EcoBoost 4. Mm -hmm. just, it'll have, you know, might have 250 horsepower or whatever, but it'll be an EcoBoost 4. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that Ford, I mean, has quietly put a stake in the ground with the most 
direct injected turbo four cylinder engines almost well not as much as Volkswagen but damn you know and this right. talk of them getting together with Dow to do high volume carbon fiber so yeah. that I find intriguing because it's all about power to weight yeah and an EcoBoost 4 and a Mustang a future Mustang could actually be an awesome package yeah I mean you know I would think there would still have to be a V8 but I you know I'm crying for one of my most favorite engines was the 215 cubic inch all aluminum Buick V8, yeah. which General Motors used for a while in the 60s. And then they sold the rights to Repco in Australia. And guess what? The Repco Brabham won the Formula 2 championship. And, and I think they also, did they win the Formula One championship? I don't know if they won the championship, but they sure raced in Formula One. And that was, that started out as that little aluminum V8, you know, from General Motors. And I think as a manufacturer, and I've talked about, I've talked with people about this, high level people, and they're like, yeah, that's okay, Pete, you know. <laughs> but I want them to do an all new, all aluminum, high tech, you know, 215 cubic inch thereabouts V8 because people still want a V8, you know, but it'll have to be a V8 that has enough punch, but still delivers the mileage. So, right. you know, with modern technology, can you imagine what that engine might do? Hey, a little but, screamer. Yeah, yeah, but anyway, the column was basically, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic time. Now the Corvette's locked in and the Mustang's almost locked in. Mm -hmm. Have so, either of you read the book, um, All Corvettes Are Red? No, I have. Yeah, I've read excerpts of it. Uh, let me tell you, it's it. fascinating about how the C7 came about and uh, the internal conflicts there. You mean the C6? Uh, so, you mean the C6? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah C6. The yeah. current one. The current. Car. Um, the current one. Yeah. And I'm sorry. And it's it's just fascinating if you ever get a chance to read it uh, all the way through. Um, uh, the internal fighting over that that vehicle right down to the balsa wood and the floors uh is uh, is fascinating anyway well you I got know, a question, I, another question for yeah really yeah. balsa wood <laughs> um i've got another question for you though and that that relates to the, and this is ford and i know ford has been kind of uh above above the fray of uh, the last couple of years uh what impact do you think that they're that ford touch and all the problems with that uh are going to have if any you know, I, I don't know, Art. I mean, I, you're more in the trenches of getting feedback from people with that. Um, you know, I'm kind of a, when it comes to, personally, when it comes to electronics, I like to get in the car and get it functional enough for me. And I, I must admit, I don't delve into this stuff like a lot of people do. Now, I understand the fix that Ford sent out for my touch was, you know, really good and all that. I don't know if the lingering impact will be there. I think the cars are too good for people to ignore. You know, they have too many great products. You know, the new Escape, I think, is going to do really well. Really well, yeah. And the new, well, the, for gearheads, that Focus ST is pretty cool. Yeah. But um, I, I don't know, Art. What's your feeling? I, I don't have a real feeling on it. Well, uh, a couple of things. Um, of those people that have Explorers, that have my Ford Touch in it, they are one uh, group of unhappy consumers. You talk uh, about the new Explorer. The new Explorer, yeah. yeah. Um, even with the updates, uh, even because they send you the the thumb drive and you put it in, you know, you leave it out in the driveway, uh, uh, running for an hour with the with the uh, thumb drive in it, and supposedly it updates everything. Um, a lot of people like the updates, but they still can't seem to get it just right. And I, uh, we had about a third of the people that have, uh, not quite a third, it was about 29% of the people who had my Ford Touch in the new Explorer who said they would recommend against the vehicle. Mm, wow. Uh, just because of the my Ford Touch in it. They would recommend the vehicle if you didn't get it, my Ford Touch, but they were very confident. Uh, that they are very un uh, not confident in the my Ford Touch ever getting fixed. Now I'm sure Ford and Microsoft are trying to fix it, but I think it was a problem that 
that started when Ford decided to use Microsoft, quite honestly. Um, you <laughs> Do you know, think the, it's also the, the, generational that, art? I mean, you no, know, I don't. No, I don't. Uh, uh, because we, we've seen it across all of the generations. We've seen it among people who are uh, fairly techy, uh, people who have gone to, um, uh, you know, uh, have have bought things like Priuses or Volts or you know other high tech items. They're not. They're not technologically uh, uh, stupid. Uh, they just simply don't like uh, what my Ford Touch has done to them. You know, that's very interesting because one of the things I've been paying attention to is how handily the Jeep Grand Cherokee is outselling the Ford Explorer right now. And that wasn't the case in the past. You know, Explorer always had better volume. Well, yep. you know, the Grand Cherokee wasn't anywhere near the vehicle there is today. Well, th that's true, too. But it, 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 I like the Uconnect system that Chrysler has. I, I think it's the graphics, the, the interface, very easy. And I wonder if that's one of the reasons why. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, the, the negative reaction to my Ford Touch is such that uh, it might uh, it might very well play that they would go to somewhere else, um, go to uh, Chrysler product, for example, or a Jeep, uh, to do the same thing. But so far, I mean, this year, if you look at sales, Ford does not seem to be affected by this. At least that's what I see no. when I look at the total numbers. It, it doesn't seem to have affected their sales. Um, and this is one of those things that doesn't necessarily affect your sales right away, but it does affect your sales in the long run, especially with repeat buyers. At trade-in time. Yep. Wow. Wow. Hey, Art, you keep track of these things. How do you see sales going in April so far? Uh, April, we're looking at, uh, just, we just had the number today. It was running right around one point, it uh, looks like the month is going to wind up right around 1.2. 1.2 uh, million vehicles. Like, yeah, about up eight, about seven and a half, eight percent. So that'd be down versus. from last month, though, right? Wasn't it uh, about 1.4? It'll be down 4? a little bit from last month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's still running. That's not that's normal for 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 uh, for April anyway. Uh, but uh, what we're also seeing is that it's about a 14.7 million. We call it a true delivery rate. We we measure it somewhat differently than SAR, but. But it's pretty much the equivalent of SAR, and uh, so it's it's not a bad month. It's uh, it's actually good. It's it's actually up, and that from all standpoints, that's that's a positive thing. Absolutely. But you know, you keep seeing all these articles appearing in the news right now <laughs> that uh, maybe there's some uncertainty out there in the manufacturing sector in the U.S., which has been really pulling everything forward. I'd, so. It's up. That's a good thing. But do you see any softening out there that would worry you? Yeah, I, I see. I see a, a significant amount of softening. We, we saw, for example, in the first uh, twenty days of this month, uh, or the first uh, half of this month, we saw uh, floor traffic. Uh, floor traffic um, softer. It was up, but it wasn't as strong as it had been in the Meaning first three. Meaning, not months. as many people going into showrooms. Going into a showroom, correct. Uh, and uh, and in addition, uh, the closing rates are. Uh, they're up also, but again, they're not up uh, to the level that would uh, put you on any kind of a 15 or 15 and a half million unit track. Well, um, we're not going to hit 15 million anyway. I mean, here's yeah, this fire yeah, there, that just shut gonna... down this German chemical company. Now nobody's going to be able to build brake lines. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but they said some uh, carpeting problem. company yeah. is going to step in. Did you read that? No. Yeah. A carpeting company. Yeah. Let me see if I can find this. Oh, very, yeah, you looked that up, because I want to ask Art, because showroom traffic is uh, a, a leading indicator, too, right? Not just people buying right now today, but maybe buying down the road a bit. Yeah, normally from the first time that someone starts walking into a showroom and looking, what we normally, what we wind up seeing is about a two to three month lag between they actually go out and make the actual acquisition. Uh, so, so whenever we're looking at showroom, we're also looking at, you know, when those folks are going to wind up coming back and actually deciding to buy. Uh, that's about a two to three month delay, uh, and that's normal. That's it got during the recession. It it, it climbed to as much as uh, ten months. Uh, so, you know, we're back down to what is considered a normal historic level of about three three and a half months. So we might see but, this June, July time frame or something like that. 
if there's a real softening happening out there, it would show up in the numbers, I'm saying, in a couple of months. That's correct, yeah. Hmm. yeah. Interesting. Did you find and it? And we're yeah. also seeing, fortunately, we're also seeing a lot of subprime approvals, uh, uh, subprime uh, auto loans being sold, which yeah. is, you know, that's good for, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're you know, you're you're looking at uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of vehicles that can be added to the mix simply because of looser credit, and we're still seeing a little bit of that going on. Hmm. Yeah, so Stainmaster uh, in Wichita, Wichita-based Invista Inc. confirmed that its Victoria, Texas plan is working at capacity to produce. Cyclododecatrine, or CDT, a chemical and key ingredient in the widely used automotive resin called nylon 12. Well. So they're stepping oh, into right. the breach. Wow. Well, that's good news. Yeah. That's great news. Because that's the last thing this industry needed was uh, another supplier disruption. Yeah. Hey, it, it's time for us to take another uh, commercial break here and then come back and get audience questions for rapid fire. So, Ben, uh, let's give a, a shout out to our friends at Chevy. It was more than a car to him. It really was his baby. Oh, no. That's my old Chevy. Dear God. Okay, well, it's that time of the show where we've got to entertain questions from the audience. And Ben, let her rip. Okay, DC Auto Geek throws this out to all of us, but Art, we'll start with you. If you were running Mazda today, which automaker would you partner up with? Chrysler. Oh, interesting. I would have said the yeah. same thing. Really? Why do you guys say that? No, because Sergio's, uh, Sergio's always Peter looking first. for Go a ahead, deal. <laughs> Sergio's always looking for a deal, especially if he can buy something at deep discount. How about you? Yeah, I agree. I think that's exactly the reason. Wow. Okay. Uh, Mitch wants to know, Art, could you say a bit about how car companies are targeting younger buyers? Do they care about anything else beyond in-car electronics? Younger buyers, do yeah. they care about? Yeah, no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the only things that one of the things we're seeing people, younger driver, younger people in general, what we found is that they they socialize. We used to socialize by wheel, you know, steering wheel, four wheels. We used to socialize by wheel. They socialize by thumbs, <laughs> and 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 quite honestly you have to put it into a car but you're going to have there, there's going to have to be a whole new attitude um uh, about how to reach those younger consumers and and what to get them they they literally are more willing to you see they still have to pay for insurance to pay for gasoline it's much easier to to just buy an I, iphone and communicate that way um they don't do the same kind of communicating social communicating that that we used to do. You'd pile everybody into a car. I remember having 12 people in a Nash Rambler convertible uh, <laughs> once uh, going to his friend's swimming pool, you know, but you don't do that anymore. We each would have had our own iPhone and would have been talking that way. So um, it really does come down to uh, having the right electronics, the right electronics in a vehicle, and, uh, and, and second, having a decent price and good fuel economy. Hmm. Personally, if I had to choose between an iPhone and piling into a car to go to a swimming pool party, I'd be in the car, man. <laughs> yeah, me yeah, too. Really. <laughs> me too. That's depressing. Too depressing to contemplate. <laughs> right. Okay, J.D. Clough says, don't you think that the back of the XTS, Cadillac XTS, looks too much like the LaCrosse? Not really. I mean, you have to see the car in the flesh. Uh, I actually think the XTS is going to be a, a, yeah, you've said a surprise industry hit, for, for at least for GM. I think, you know, they've got everything on the line on the ATS, which I think dynamically it sounds great. I, I don't think it quite looks as good as, for some reason. It doesn't look as good to me uh, as it should. But I think the XTS, you know, because Art, you know this, remarkably enough, there are a lot of people over 50 with, a, with money burning a hole in their pocket looking for a, yep. big, a big car. 
And yep. I think Cadillac is, you know, I think some within Cadillac are where, well aware that that might be the case, but they're not talking. I think they're hoping, but I, I expect the XGS is going to do well, and it does look really good in the flesh. The only criticism I would have, if, if you want to make a comparison to the LaCrosse, is actually with the Chevy Impala, which almost has a little bit of that sweep spear, you know, that, that curved line over the rear uh, fender, and which yeah. to me is picked up right off the LaCrosse. They're built on the same Epsilon platform. Yeah. I don't get why they added that to the, the Impala, which otherwise I think is a pretty good looking car. Okay, uh, another Mazda question here from Steve who says, shouldn't Mazda make the next RX just a V6 MX-5 with at least 300 horsepower? Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it would take 300 horses. I mean, you know, Mazda, you know, they, they still have a rotary, you know, skunk works and they're still clinging to that. You know, I like rotaries flat out, but they have no torque and you know, they've, they've never done anything for me. So I, you know, I'll be surprised if there's an RX-9 and if it is, it'll probably be a Chrysler. <laughs> <laughs> Arndt says, uh, Audi picking Mexico. Is this mainly for reasons uh, to pick the NAFTA country with the best trade agreement with all countries globally? And I guess I'll weigh in. I'll say, yeah, I think a key reason why Audi went to Mexico for its plant rather than put it in the U.S. or Canada is Mexico's got more free trade agreements. It's easier to export out of there. Yeah, it was kind of surprising. I mean, uh, some people thought they'd build a plant right next to the Volkswagen plant mm -hmm. in Tennessee, but no. Didn't go that way. Uh, Frank says, great show, guys. I saw the Fisker Karma at the New York show. Stunning car awful build quality. The white one had huge panel gaps and misalignment. I love Fisker's designs, but they need someone to build these things. How about Ford? Well, they, you know, they brought in Lasorda, mm -hmm. Tom Lasorda, but you know, that company has deeper issues. And... It does. But one thing I would say is I don't believe those, uh, and this was the Nina that they're talking about that was shown at the New York show. That's not built on production tooling. So before we all go and criticize these cars for having not very good build quality, it's prototype tooling. And that stuff you can get close, but it's hard to get it dead nuts right like you do with production tooling. And I'm not making excuses for Fisker because you guys know I've been a huge critic of the, that whole program relying on so much government money at least to get going. But I will say don't judge Fisker's design just based on a show car at the New York show. That's my input. No reaction. Okay. <laughs> okay, Richard Cruz says, any news about Ford building a new supercar like the GT? Will they redesign it or make a whole new model? And a question I've always wanted to ask, why didn't Ford ever build the 1994, 1995 Ford GT90 that was way ahead of its time? Which I believe was a Fisker design, the yeah, GT90. I can tell you that there is no uh, GT replacement on the horizon at Ford. They are all hands on deck to make the Mustang as, as good as it can possibly be. Yeah. You don't think they need a halo car? The Mustang's it? Well, for now, in, in the current economic climate, yeah, I don't see it happening. Um, the GT was kind of a one-off thing, and it's too bad. They might muster it up again. I think they did it right. Just yeah. saying, we're going to build X, whatever that was, 5,000 units, and then pff, no more. That's it. I don't no. think it was not that, even that much. No, uh, okay. I thought it was initially fifteen hundred, and then they took it up to something like thirty-five hundred okay. or something. I think that's the right way to do that's, it. That I really is, do. That makes it an instant classic. Protects those who bought the car, because then you're not just pumping them out year after year. It's and that's what GM debates constantly internally if to do. Now, one thing I put in, in my website that no one picked up to, and they will rue the day they didn't, but I, <laughs> I, GM is going to take Corvette to the, the prototype level and go to Le Mans under the new regulations that go into effect in 2014. Now, Porsche is going to be there too mm -hmm. with the new car, but that's, that's the fact. GM is working on an all-new prototype racer, and 
uh, Corvette will be left to privateers who want to run them in GT, but the factory effort's going to be to win the overall at Le Mans. Now, that's a huge piece of news that no one, you know, followed up. Nate Ryan of USA Today did. Nate's, uh-huh. pretty, Nate's pretty astute. He's always got his... Uh, hands on what's happening and he he contacted me but that's huge news wow and no one's talking wow. about it but i will tell you i'm yes. glad you brought it up on this show yeah yeah so um that will be the first time now gm went to Le Mans in the early 2000s with the cadillac effort that was yep. under under supported underfunded and you know gm got bored well actually they the cadillac program got just on the verge of being really good and GM had a decision to make to spend something like $50 million to develop the racing version of direct injection and they wouldn't spend the money. Now, what did they do? They pulled the plug and spent the money in R&D developing direct injection for production cars. Racing companies do it the other way around. You know, they go develop direct injection on the track and then it comes back down to the production cars. GM at that time screwed it all up. You know, they, you know, they had a decision to make and the Cadillac program went away. So I don't, unfortunately, I thought the people that worked on that program were well-intentioned, but the company's philosophy, their, their head wasn't in the game. So to me, this is the first time since the Ford effort in the 60s that it's a legitimate, all hands on deck company effort from from an American car company. The Cadillac one doesn't count because GM didn't really know what they were doing and didn't buy into it. it. This effort is going to be the real deal. Good, well I hope they do it right because not only was the Cadillac effort not well done, but they went to Le Mans beating their chest, flying the American flag everywhere, you know, spent a huge amount of money. Oh yeah, they they did it all wrong. And instead of going out and proving themselves and then bragging about it. They started bragging from the get-go and then fell flat on their faces. And what did they do? And don't forget that there was a huge global media event in Italy two weeks or a week after Le Mans. Mm -hmm. So not, you know, so what did they do? They had arranged to be the pace cars at Le Mans. And then they have something like 500 journalists that were being flown in the week after the race and a, a couple hundred, hundred of them went to the race. And then what happens? One of the Cadillacs catches fire, I don't know, three hours in or two hours into the race. It was just a debacle. And then, you know, they kept working on the car, but they did it ass backwards. And, that, you know, the German car company, you'll never see the German car companies do something like that. Mm-hmm. They'll show up. They don't say much. We're just here to learn. Give us three or five years. Yeah, and kind then, of, of right. course, you know, a year later, it's like all world. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. Yeah, Uber alles. <laughs> so, you know, but I'm encouraged because of a couple things. Corvette, that Corvette racing program has been one of the most successful uh, racing programs in the world yes. for a long time. Right. It's something for American enthusiasts to be proud of. And, you know, Pratt & Miller is one of the, the best technical entities in the business and just down the road yeah just down the road and you can talk to anyone formula one everyone they have utmost respect for pratt and miller and they're working on this car and i fully believe that it will be competitive and they know how to do it they know how to get it done you know i don't know when they're going to do track testing but i would be shocked if it wasn't this summer Hmm. wow well as i said before i'm glad you brought that up on this show (laughs) we missed a lot of We've missed a lot of comments, but... No, that's okay. Uh, but we'll go through a few more of them. Okay, Bama Theo from Twitter says, is the Silverado going to be worth the wait, or should I buy a Ram? That new Ram's pretty impressive. That's a pretty nice vehicle. They've got some pretty cool technology on that. But I've always said, if you're going to use your truck for commuting and running around and everything like that, get the Ram. If you want true heavy duty work truck, get the F-150. And if you're in between, then go with the Silverado. I, I don't know if that still applies, but I think you know uh, over the last decade, that, that's how I would have characterized them. John, that goes back all the way back into the um, 
uh, hist- all, all the way back into history in, in terms of if you wanted a car like truck, you went with the uh, you went with the Chevy. You want a real work truck? Uh, it was always things like the uh, like the Ram and the F fifty or F F one fifty and F series uh, were always work trucks, but they were um, uh, a little more refined than what the Dodge was. Dodges were. That's that's not the same today, but uh, for the most part, you you can't lose with any one of the three. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing where trucks have gone. I mean, yeah. it's, it's almost hard to call them trucks anymore because of the level of refinement and content. You can get anything on them these days. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe we'll go with uh, <laughs> one me. more here. Uh, this is from A.M. Guerrero, who said, I saw photos of the updated 2013 Chevy Traverse and was surprised to see that the distinctive Chevy twin port grille is missing in its place as a generic looking three bar grille. Is this a new styling direction for Chevy? Yes. Yep. You see it on the new Impala. Right. Yeah. And, and personally, I never liked that dual port grill. It just never worked to, for my eye. So I'm, I'm glad they got rid of it. Yeah, I am too. Um, oh, and then he's got another follow-up. Speaking of SUVs, when does Ford to plan to drop in new engines in the Expedition? The F-150 already has them. Well, you know, I don't know what... Ford is going to do the expedition, you know. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Maybe there ain't no expedition going forward, right. and that's why it's not getting the new engens. Because you would have thought that they'd have been most dropped sense. in there. Or maybe it's yeah. an extended wheelbase explorer. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, uh, this is a good time to wrap it up. Art, it's been awesome having you on the uh, show with us. It's been fun us. having you. Art, it's always, always fun being there. Art, it's always great to see you. And, uh, yeah, you too. So how far are these courses from your house? I'd just like to know. <laughs> Let's just put it that they're within, uh, well, a, 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 somebody with a good game of golf could drive uh, from here to there uh, with a golf club, not, not driving a car. Um, me, it would probably be, uh, at least, a, a <laughs> seven par, I would guess, uh, maybe more. Uh, but I, I, one last thing I wanted to say, and, and, and this is, then I'll leave you guys alone. Halo car of the century for me is the crown Vic. I, I wish they never had gotten rid of it. Oh, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, you know, with the new Mustang coming, I think Ford absolutely needs to do a rear wheel drive full-size Lincoln off of that platform. They absolutely need a full-size rear-wheel drive Lincoln. And you're absolutely right, Art. Uh, I would have done er- everything in my power to keep that that platform going. I would have too. And uh, in fact, my idea always, Art, was to do a super decontented version that chopped maybe half a foot off the back of the car, take a couple of hundred pounds out of it, I'd put in crank windows, eliminate the radio. You can put in your own iPad if you want, iPod, excuse me. I would go back to non-painted bumpers. I would get the price of that thing down to about 18 grand MSRP and put a diesel in it. And I would use that to go after the youth market. There you go. Let me tell you, I've got one uh, with flames on the hood, side pipes. It's a cool car. <laughs> And, you know, that thing is so over-designed, not only is it body on frame, the body is body integral. You could meet the crash standards even if that thing wasn't bolted to the frame. That's how over-designed it is, and that's why the cabbies like it so much. That's where the cops used it so much. Right. I got to tell you, I mean, uh, you know, the new cab was at the New York show, and, uh, you know, that's going to be a... A sea change in Manhattan to see all those yellow things running around. Oh, they're so ugly. And while we're on that, Simon, hi, wherever you are. <laughs> and, and to our earlier discussion about Dick Clark, hey, Dick, thanks a million. But uh, first time caller, long time listener sent me a thing that the ABC show was called Where the Action Is. Oh, that had, oh. That had Paul Revere and the Raiders a lot. I remember uh, that, and they shot it, uh, I think, right on the beach in Santa Monica or something, as uh, I recall. Hmm. 
Well, anyway, once again, Art, great having you. We'll have you back again. And Peter, thanks, guys. Thanks, Art. Great seeing you again, too. Yeah, yeah, you too. And thanks, everybody, for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion, and by Chevrolet, Chevy runs deep. So, yeah, good show, Art. Why, well, thanks. That was, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing that. Well, you know, a lot of good stuff to talk about, too. Jeez. Yeah, I mean. We didn't even get to some of the stuff. I wanted to talk about these natural gas vehicles. Yeah. That's one of the things a, we actually promoed that we'd be talking about tonight. Well, let's talk about it right now. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, what would you say, $11,000? Well, that's what Chevy said, that, you know, for only an el extra eleven grand, you too can have your Silverado run on natural gas. And to me, it's, that's why these things are never going to catch on. The no. conversion cost is horrific. That's a lot. Well, and, 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 and for anybody to say only $11,000. Well, that's me saying only. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Chevy said that. Oh, okay. But I, I, I bet but you, you Chevy know, I think, thinks well, that, though. I, I think a, a natural gas Civic is an extra five grand. Yeah. And then if you want to put the, the natural gas filler in your garage, which is, you mean, fill. Which is called fill. Which fill. I love that. that no, that's very clever. <laughs> but it's like an extra two grand. So, yeah. you know, you want a natural gas Civic with a, be able to refill it at home, that's seven grand more. It's so crazy. So that means you have to live in the Southwest somewhere and you have to keep that car for, what, 12 years or something? Something like that. <laughs> At least. I mean, this least. is why electrics don't catch on. You know, they're just so much more expensive. And, and everybody goes, why is it so expensive? Because it's very easy to convert an engine to run on natural gas. And that's true. But the, the, the problem is you got to be able to meet all the crash standards. So that means the tank in the trunk and the lines going to the engine have got to be able to take 40 mile an hour impacts and not leak anything. So you have like Fort Knox built into the car just to get the natural gas to the engine. And that's where the expense comes in. Yeah, because you certainly don't want any blowed up real good incidents. <laughs> 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 that's right. Yeah. So Art, do you really have a Crown Vic? Yeah, 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 I do. With it's got a Crown Vic. It's got uh, it's got some uh, cop tires, performance cop stuff on it. It's got hot tires and wheels. It's got side exhaust. Catalytic converters went south a long time ago. So um, side exhaust, you must have had to have those custom made, right? No, I actually I wound up I wound up finding them. They go exactly from front wheel well all the way to the back wheel well. They're uh, they're pretty cool. Wow. Um, yeah, it's uh, got flames on the hood and on the side and cool it's 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 my cruiser yeah what, what motor do you have in it uh it's it's the stock motor yeah, it, okay. well it's an interceptor motor i mean it's a police interceptor package on it oh cool that's great yeah. my yeah. my crown victoria story is that uh a few years ago i had to actually it's more than a few years ago it's at least a decade ago i was going up to traverse city for the management briefing seminars and my wife and kids were coming up with me too and I happened to have a dark blue Crown Vic that, for my test drive that week. And my kids were all like, oh, Dad, why did you get an old man's car? Ugh. Do we have to go in that stupid thing? By the end of the trip, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. They're like, wow, this is like sitting on a couch. It's so comfortable. They thought it was really cool. And the other thing that I noticed is, I'm going up 75, going up north. I'm going 80 miles an hour. Each people see yep. you in their mirrors and, and they think they're cops. I'm halfway up cops. north and I realize, you know, I have not touched the brakes. I haven't adjusted the cruise control because to your point, Peter, everybody's seeing this blue crown Vic come up in the mirrors, man, and they're pulling <laughs> over to the side and boom. Cool. No well, traffic guess, for me. I've got underhood. I've got, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I've got under underbody lights that flash. <laughs> And, uh, and the one in the front is behind the grill, and you can't you can't see it unless you turn it on. And my son and I were driving down uh, Highway 101 one day, and I had forgotten that I had turned them on. And so the blue lights are going on and on and on. People are pulling over, and I can't figure out why. And that's because I'm, I'm blue lights flashing in the mirror off of a Crown Vic. So that's great. 
Yeah. That well. is good. Well, you should take a picture of it or, or send us pictures of it. We'll, we'll oh, show sure. them on the show. Sure. Yeah, that'd be sure. cool. <laughs> good. Okay. Well, we're going to sign right. off then. But again, it's been great having you. Hey, thanks an awful lot, guys. Yeah, take take care. care.